So, hello everyone. Nice that you made it and uh, even like uh, left the snacks alone and come here to talk, uh, to listen to our talk. So, uh, my name is Stefan Evers and this is uh, Philip. Hi, nice to meet you. And we will tell you a little bit about our story um, trying to find our path from embedded to edge and uh, trying to introduce product lines in our company. So we are both from Bosch. Uh, I am from Bosch IO. That is 100% subsidiary of Robert Bosch GmbH. Yeah, and, and I am directly hired at the Robert Bosch GmbH mother company. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, typically, when I'm coming to the US and I'm talking about Bosch, many people don't even know exactly what this company is about. So I want to give you a little bit of uh, background for Bosch. So we are not only producing dryers and dishwashers and things like that. We also are the, the biggest or one of the biggest uh, car part manufacturers. So, um, so the so-called tier one. Besides from that, we also do drilling machines. We do uh, things like, uh, you know, the, on the ceilings, this fire detectors and all these things. So we are producing actually a lot of things. Many, many different kind of things in di different domains. So also when you try to produce th something, we are also doing a lot of uh, industrial manufacturing uh, devices. So we are therefore working in many different areas and we are producing many different things in these different areas. And that in the last 10 years, when you like, uh, were observing what is happening in the technology, many of these things are getting more and more connected. And uh, that's what they call more or less the internet of things. So getting all these devices connected is changing a lot. So if that's not the only thing, we will talk about other things later, but changing, uh, connecting these things means that actually they are also somehow, let's say, um, exposed for uh, some, any kinds of attacks and things like that. You're hearing a lot of stories about these things. So it means on the one side that you need to protect the device against these attacks. On the other hand, it also means that, for example, you have the opportunity typically to update and when you have the opportunity to update, more or less customers and uh, everyone around it is expecting that these things also getting, let's say, more modern over time. So all this brings a lot of change. And this change uh, that is coming with the Internet of Things is affecting these companies that are producing devices one way or the other to a large extent. So what does this have to do with Linux? Of course, like we use Linux in many, many devices and we uh, did like a little research internally and we are expecting that in 2025 roughly, we will produce around 50 million devices based on Linux per year. And when you do a little bit of calculation, so the, the prices of these devices vary a lot. So we have some devices that are rather inexpensive and we have other devices that are even, that are really expensive, like even up to 100,000. So, but in the middle, when you say, it, let's say roughly about $100 uh, dollars per device, then 50 million, and you say 1% uh, is only invested in the Linux part, you already have $50 million only for like the Linux part. But we've talked to many different of our business units and the different business units, uh, some of them are even, even saying 50 million, that's what we are spending on our own on that stuff. So. It's even more. So that's like, in a certain extent, it's a, like a lower limit what uh, like a company like ours are expecting that they spend on Linux, one way or the other, like maintaining it, developing it, making sure that it works, all the things together, at least. So it's like a lower limit. But I think uh, uh, when we are at that point, it will be significantly more. So Linux is important for us like for, I guess, for nearly every uh, industrial manufacturer. And when you look at the things that happened in these years, 10 years I am, that I'm looking at, um, I already said 
because they are connected, things are changing. And the main thing is, before it was more or less you develop the device and when it's finished, you try not to touch it. So you focused a lot on the building part, a lot on everything that happens before start of production. That is your main focus. But with the changes that I described, you also have to look a lot in the phases afterwards. So you have to look at the time when actually the maintenance takes place. And that also brings a lot of changes into the entire development process and how you treat everything. And uh, that's also what, uh, like what we can see when we talk to all the different projects uh, that are doing uh, Linux devices inside our company. One thing is that when you look at the problem or problems that they are having, so as when you're really focused on trying to get the device finished uh, according to the specifications that has been given to you or like uh, making your customer happy, so you, it, you have a very clear goal and you have a more or less like a deadline. And when you look at the maintenance time, it's very different. It's much more open and you don't know exactly what to expect. So collaboration before was maybe not so important, but when you're doing maintenance, you have to do it very di in a very different way because you have to see what is happening. You, you need to know what, is, what are the problems, you need to know how to fix it over a long time, and so you need to establish something much more uh, sustainable than when you're looking at you know, single devices and producing them. So that is something that we are learning. So it's uh, maybe you haven't seen uh, Bosch or, or the, the name in like uh, kernel development or anything like that. That's typically because, um, at least in the past, we um, often what we are doing we are paying third party uh, third parties to do these things. So it's not that uh, we are not doing anything. We are just consuming. We are we are doing a lot of things, but it's actually through a third party. But when this becomes like a, such an important element, that as we had it then it's more or less becomes a crucial part of the business that you understand how to do the maintenance over the long time and how do you do the collaboration with all the projects, with upstream, with corresponding uh, open source projects, with distributions, with, uh, with partners that have the expertise, with manufacturers, uh, provider, uh, service providers, with uh, suppliers. So the entire ecosystem is changing, and that's what we are seeing. So in all this, we, what we started was we were trying to f identify a way to like, change things for us. And so we started an internal project where we were trying to do like, as many as possible, looking at all these different topics, trying to understand how it is, like seeing what is the structure all over our company, how, what, is, uh, what can be consolidated in that, and what is like the, the interesting, interesting part of that where we can focus on to make things better for us. So it's very, actually very easy. So we have the, the core element and that is more or less uh, like a, a Bosch uh, derivative of any kind of Linux that we can use in as many devices as we could. That was the idea that we had at the beginning. It turned out not to be so simple. So you have the, the Linux part that you focus on, but then you realize there's a lot of things around it. You have like an entire system around that. And so we have done a lot of, we've, we've focused on many different areas. And one thing was, okay, so we have one uh, area that is automotive, that is a central part of it. And uh, we developed a Debian very uh, derivative uh, that was uh, another company and that was something that uh, we called then Apertis. So that is for, in particular, it was uh, meant for infotainment systems, but uh, we will see later that it's also now used for other things. But we also have things like uh, the communication with, uh, with the cloud side. Of course, that is in IoT uh, an important part. For that, we have different open source projects started uh, at the Eclipse Foundation, and one of them is Eclipse Canto. Um, that is another important part of that 
element. Also the open source uh, management that, that we are like focusing on, that is uh, compliance is uh, important in such a scenario for us. And uh, we've also done a lot in the open source review toolkit. We also tried to do other areas. So we have, for example, uh, Eclipse Coxa, which is a project where we've been active that was trying to get the IoT stuff more, uh, more used and more um, usable in uh, the automotive area. That was originally like a publicly funded uh, project and uh, it's, uh, it became an open source project. So that is like what we have been doing in the past, but we realized this is still not enough. And there's a lot of things to do, a lot of things that we need to do in the, in the future. And we realized uh, it's also a cultural change inside the company. And that is maybe even the biggest struggle. And anyone who knows how to organize change, those cultural changes are maybe the biggest uh, challenge in something like that. So it is actually not um, so easy to do these changes. So it takes its time, but uh, we, we are moving and that's helping us a lot. And we are also really um, thankful that it's working with many different people and open source projects and open source communities, foundations like the Linux Foundation. And it's really great that uh, these things are getting forward. So we have like many other things that we now doing in the future and uh, Philip will tell us much more about the story in like these areas that we that we have not so so much like uh, investigated in the past and tell us more about it but before I do that uh, before we I'm handing that over I want to give you like the focus areas what we are currently um, f concentrating on and that is actually what you see here in the right side it's container software management so that's mainly open source compliance and um, like mainlining the SSC uh, drivers and things like that. So getting the things in the mainline kernel is like something that we, we heard about it uh, today. For example, Tim Burt uh, mentioned that, that this is, would be a great thing that this is happening more. And that is also something that, that we would like to see because it's helping us a lot when things are working with the mainline kernel itself. But also security, we're like, uh, we have also heard a lot uh, about security. That's also, of course, as I mentioned, a very important topic for us. So that's something that we are focusing on as well. And virtualization and containers is something that is uh, keeping us busy because uh, we see that this is going into the embedded space so that all the container stuff and the virtualization that we've seen in the cloud side is now becoming more and more also like a topic, how can we use this cool technology in the embedded world? And uh, that is a topic that is also keeping us uh, busy right now. So now Philip will tell us a little bit more yep. about the things that we are doing here. Here, thanks a lot, Stefan. So first of all, maybe uh, from the functional areas which you've just mentioned, I will not touch virtualization as much in this call, actually not any further. And I'll also leave out the so security pass for security we will actually uh, submit a talk for the embedded Linux conference in Dublin see if it's get accepted and then we have a full session just about security measures which we have done and now I'll just start with the reference system elements one element is container we'll talk more about the OSS compliance I will have two slides and this these are rather short um, also there, there will be a proposal to be hopefully accepted at the OSS summit in Dublin and I spend a few more words on a purchase for the SOC up driver, a mainlining, and so on. Um, and well, this is the embedded Linux conference, so it should be a longer Linux part in there. Right, um, I'll start with the container work in there. We originally had a large set of different container elements. Uh, we looked for what there, there are embedded container frameworks also, which uh, the guys from Foundries I.O. are there, <laughs> so I guess you're also providing elements. Uh, we have Balena, Toradex, and others. Um, a lot of these frameworks actually work either on, are based on LXC or on Docker. Uh, Flatback may be an example for, for different kinds. It's not exactly like this. And what we also considered was Podman. I judge Podman as a little bit more lightweight than the full Docker, but it's having the same API. So basically you could 
just replace the things, and we would like to see how the influence is there. Um, some others are mentioned here, which we just put into consideration. We do some benchmark just to get a better understanding how things are on this. And what we were looking for is like, we wanted to get an understanding. As uh, Stefan told you, we worked a lot with experts, external support, but it's only worse if you also get a basic understanding because you need to describe your requirements. You need to understand what it means when you talk about security mechanisms, about updates, and so on. So we want to get hand-on experience and share this with the developers so that also Bosch developers can go outside. Um, yeah, first message, of course, there is no, nothing as such like the best container framework. There are benefits and drawbacks depending on your use case. And just to show you some results, which we did, um, First unimportant part, maybe CPU memory usage. Uh, we tried some stress and G testing. Shouldn't go too close to the speaker. Um, here, as they basically all use the same APIs underneath because it, and you end up in the same system calls and heavily depends just on the CPU which you have, how much utilization is in there. Similar for the disk I.O. performance. Well, there you're either limited by the MMC storage. If you put an SSD, it looks different. So there is, you could really see that all the frameworks basically show a similar performance on this. So it doesn't have an impact. So if you want to elevate on your, evaluate on your own, don't uh, spend too much time or do it in a more clever way than we did. Then um, some measurements which were really interesting were more on the, uh, like the round trip times. If you have TCP network communication from host to the container framework or to the containers as such, here, uh, important to mention, if you try to get a container to container communication or inside the system, of course, sometimes it goes over to virtual network devices and you suddenly experience awesome network transfer speed like 12, 13, 14 gigabit per second while you have just a one gigabit interface, you wonder why it happens. Well, it never ends up the physical file into the file. So therefore, I just took here TCP round trip elements and um, well, yeah, then certain latency and startup. Of course, if you start up something, it depends on the system size which you have. Of course, there also start if it loads more. So this is just here. You may think that, as I said, there is no such perfect solution, but it looks a lot like Flatpak would be the best choice, right? If you just compare the numbers. Um, what we figured out from the corporate usage um, for Flatpak, it's not as widespread as Docker and LXC. So the documentation is also not as extensive. And especially if you go into corporate use, you need to make sure that the different developer can also understand it, get fast training and so on. And we had to learn a lot and maintain a lot to get this flat pack up and running. So we said, this is something for special use cases. Right, so this is a key message here. Um, even don't trust only the performance numbers, also make up your mind on the use cases and what comes on top with documentation. Uh, with, for example, also with uh, the LXC, which is more lightweight, but there is no OCI compliance fully, so it's much nicer to have something which is OCI compliant if you have a widespread product use. Also there it helps to later maybe exchange some framework extender. So this is something for the container, but what we then figured out, we, we need to orchestrate the whole thing. And there are a few solutions on there. So uh, there's micro chaos or, Kubernetes, Cube Edge. So there are solutions out there. Uh, depending on your embedded use case, they may still be too powerful because they have too many features in there which you may not need. And um, then they are also not fully made for embedded. So you, if you think about the reliability of your system and the network reliability, so typically when you come to a okay, orchestration, you have a host, if a server, data center, then you communicate, but your embedded device may not be always reachable, so it needs to be have certain autonomy when you use this, then um, you're not firing to service, but you have very limited resources, and the, if you just prepare something while you use CI, CD pipeline, you may have a small device, a large device, so also how you orchestrate the containers on the device, how you deploy them, makes a whole lot of difference. For this, uh, we just started our work. We just thought there are a lot of elements, but similar like we had for the benchmarking, we see there's not such perfect solution yet. Uh, we're actually looking on potential cooperation and partnership to figure out who's interested in this topic, where to bring this forward. And then as we have a very spread use 
of technologies, our idea is to bring this very much forward into a main line. So this is something very important for this. Uh, also very interesting, I need to get a hand, a good over hand over to my next slide, um, is the S-bomb generation within container. So because containers get modified, you don't always know what's in there, how to generate, and so on. While you generate your container, there you may have things in place. And for this, um, I briefly want to mention the OSS Review Toolkit. There are good talks about this much better than when I have. Uh, Marcel Kurzmann, a Bosch colleague, gave a good presentation last year, December, on the OSS Summit or Compliance Summit in Japan. He will continue this in Dublin. Um, here, what I like to stress is it's very interesting to see that even if you do certain SBOM generation, if you have compliance, you may have special licenses in there. You may have a corporate policy, what you're allowed to use, what you're not allowed to use. And here, a good framework, a very flexible framework is there and needed to generate an output. And you could see from the sli last slide, which Stefan showed, there is the SPDX. This could be a good input and output powers for such frameworks. So um, I just shortly show the OSS Review Toolkit there. Provides a lot of elements in there. There's typically, what I like about it uh, is that it's really modules. So you can just say, I, I need a certain module, which I haven't made use of yet. So I grab this one. I'll take the analyzer, take the report generation. It, heavily relies on APIs between which are quite stable or handle wire configurations. And so it's possible to interact with other projects and open source projects. And this tool actually gets extended, so we're currently working also that it can handle not only Yocta, Debian, but also Elbe, Ezar, and other flavors of uh, build tools on this. Right. Um, yeah, Apertus is the one which is supported in there. We, um, haven't said that much about Apertus yet, which is the embedded Linux part of it, so I'll jump into this. Um, as Stefan said, Apertus originally came from automotive. Why? Because there are powerful devices. Some don't call it embedded even anymore because it's, I mean, it's multi-core CPUs and the Raspberry Pi 4 partially has lower performance than the typical instrument cluster and the navigation devices, so they're actually more powerful on this. But as we see, there's so much usage from the high numbers in there, and everybody just starts and just say, well, I start my project here. I'm working in uh, building technology, power tools, home appliances, industrial. Let me check. Oh, I have an SOC here, so I grab the next Yocta release, and I just start, and I don't make my mind up yet in the beginning on what does it mean for security, what does it mean for maintenance, and but I get a quick start, and for this, we said we need to have something in place, which is a full-blown toolkit, and this differentiates Apertus a little bit from just taking a pure Debian distro because we need to put it into a company-wide focus. But for this, um, we already provide pre-built images for different architectures. We have different reference hardware. We also have Raspberry Pi 4 supported, and our yeah, old menu boards, several uh, so NXP devices are in there, runners so you get a formal set, and we're continuously also increasing the number of devices in there. Uh, yeah, documentation is important as well, so these all elements which are part of Apertus, and this also enables that we, when we come from an automotive, that we can make use of this in further devices for, like, bicycle, where you can see also there's an embedded Linux on the most powerful ones, on this, those which have navigation enabled, uh, there are robo robots which are getting more powerful, where it get connected. And for this, also industrial appliance came in. Um, as this is quite their extends use or a wide product range, and we're talking about product lines, um, we can see that, well, we see the big question mark. I guess this is the most prominent part in there. We currently have Apertus, and we try to make it more open source, get more people around it. And why? Because we believe in an embedded Debian, which formed the base which you can take uh, as from a clearance of the upstream part that you say, we have a package selection here, keep this in mind, there's more resource elements. And already now we bring everything back upstream, which is done in Apertus. But we still need a vehicle where we can just have short time patches in until they are upstreamed. So basically there is upstream first policy, but there are the demands of customers where you need to hook in. And with a public reference, there's a chance to make use also from divisions if you don't need to really 
work in a product environment yet. On top there is then here like the product where it comes in, which we have here, Apertus Pro, which uh, enables people in a certain environment. So maybe you are creating your product and you don't want to have everything visible yet. You're in an early production phase. You customize your thing. So this gets more, I, I like to compare it a little bit with uh, the embedded Debian, which is similar maybe to uh, Fedora Linux. Then you have a CentOS like the Apertus and then a rail. Uh, for the Apertus Pro, so just from the business model element in there. And this typically goes into the products. Uh, it looks like many steps, but we try to bring and push everything down, like in a tree that we said, it don't make much effect if you do it at the leaf, but if you go down to the root and change things there, it, all the whole tree benefits from the work in there. How we do so also is um, that we enable also building source packages because we see there are a lot of packages coming and if we are Debian based, more think about binary packages. So we have a good set of binary packages, but we include the building from source in there. We put things together um, and create images. We have a virtual file system in which we create an image to get a deployable part. We have OS3 involved. Uh, we may also change forward to ro rogue and uh, there's something in there. Along, we figured out you also need to have some issue tracking with it and also for our usage. We have started with a fabricator. We are now migrating further to GitLab to have a consolidation on the tools so that we don't have too many things in there. And uh, yeah, there's Lava for, for testing involved. We have test farms because we figure using existing things is much ben more beneficial than reinventing the wheel every now and then again. Right. Uh, some practical things to get in. I would like to talk like for the handling of GPL3. I, I may not make too many friends because there is a stream which says we should have also GPL3 enabled, but unfortunately I have to say there are sometimes demands which, well, the most restrictive license which I have seen more or less was on the benchmarking part, and this benchmarking tool prohibited to share the results of the benchmark to another company or customer if this customer was not licensing exactly the same version of this benchmark. And if you need to handle these kind of constraints somewhere and you have maybe a potential binary somewhere in there which you would like to also give to a supplier, so then GPL with three handling and wrong handling in there could cause quite some uh, cost extensive result. And well, GPL with three is still uh, something like poisonous in the automotive because also car projection with Apple CarPlay and uh, Google Elements. And there are also causes to think, how can we handle this? Anyway, we publish things, but we cannot have full GPL3 part in there. Um, one pain point, many talk about Bash, because there's a Bash shell to begin. But Debian, long time ago, I guess it was with Ubuntu 604, they already changed to Dash as default. But still, there was always Bash, and there were still scripts in there. There were script calls in there. So we did a lot of cleanup there with our external partner. and. Um, so this, this was quite heavy to, to do a cleanup work and to have things more sorted out. Another one was the change when core utils changed to the GPL3. So we did a long evaluation. I put the links down there so if you, the material is uh, available as public documentation, uploaded slides, also you can just simply click on the links. And here we, we went for a Rust version. And in there, while we're using the Rust core utils, which was, well, on an MIT license, not my favorite one, but it's very nice for the industrial use. Um, there you can also see upstream patches from our partners. Then what's still open, uh, what is not nice that we are on an old GNU PG, GPL2 version. Uh, we have different elements in there. We were looking for RP, PGP and also for uh, other options, but um, uh, we are not using too much of it. It's a lot of work is from the development and not really late on in the product use. So the effort for the, the gain which we have currently does not yeah, make it rational to go forward there. Um, where the effort was really of use of and which is also nice for a company perspective is uh, the upstreaming work. So we did some upstreaming of an in-house hardware 
which first of all sound a little bit weird, uh, at least at least inside the company, because the people know that it's proprietary hardware, they say, why should I bring something which is proprietary open source? Uh, well, there are certain benefits because if it goes into main, and of course we have the testing responsibility. If updates get in, we still need to test at our site, but at least we are aware when patches come in, we, don't, we see it directly, we get interactions, and um, so for this we, we took the system master, how it's called, from the home appliance, into the, ma into the main line, we had work for U-Boot, uh, ARM-trusted firmware, uh, some Debian work was needed on this device trees, um, and we were lucky that there has already been a good support for the i.mx8 series, so therefore there was a lot of SOC support, and our hardware design was very close to reference design already supported, so the work was less effort there. Pain was causing the U-boot because the U-boot support was more intense. There was no direct board support for this. Um, we wanted to have network boot in there so that you can put a network file system in. This was causing some pain for us and many iterations. But this pain actually is a gain because you get the reviews up front. And if you have an engineer working in the company, there's typically not too many working on the bootloader. So they really get the feedback by others just compared to in-house reviews, so the quality really increase. Um, what could cause pain, of course, if you hit IP modules which are not yet supported, then you start looking into data sheets, write drivers, and uh, some of them are actually not even known by the silicon vendor because they also just source third-party IP. For this, we're just starting the work. We want to get more public in there. Uh, you saw the CIP project. We wanted to also approach the CIP project so that we get more public work on mainlining activities and to see that also silicon vendor may go away from the vendor kernel. Uh, right. I shortly want to mention I uh, we had Amarula who were involved there in this upstream process. So they were not directly sourced from our project, but they did the work in parallel while we were doing it. And there was also Collabra who did a lot of work. So if you follow the patches, they are also mentioned here in the list, you'll find the upstream works from Amarula and Collabra on this. So big thanks also to them. Um, what we would like to achieve is that we learn these things, which now currently other partners do, to do on our own, that we start with a cultural change within Bosch so that we um, work more together and um, also get more of the folks together. And I guess there are some further words on this and clothing words from Stefan. So we'll hand over to you again. Um, yeah, so you, you, you got a little bit of a glimpse into what happened uh, or happens right now inside uh, Bosch. So we are investigating different areas that Philip described uh, really nicely. And it's, it takes a lot to do this shift from the, as I said, like from the focusing on getting a device working and uh, the way it should to the point that it's actually working in a like open source way that you actually develop it this way, that you maintain it this way and that you phase it out this way. It's a long way. And it's, it involves many areas, and we described few of them, but actually it's many more. And also what, we, what you've seen, for example, that you, when you take a device, a hardware device that is not supposed to get in anywhere else, but it makes a lot of sense still that you put it mainline. For example, another example why it was useful is different parts of the company are using different Linux uh, flavors. And when we have it mainline, it actually, like everyone, hopefully, can get the version that uh, where it's already working out of the box. And, and so that's one We actually had a recent example on this where the one Bosch business unit in Bosch was already using a certain device family. And by our work, which we did, they're figuring out that another business unit also uses the same. And they're just starting a project. So by this, we have established a contact. And they can now exchange information on this, really, on this level. And we said, why limit this to the company? Uh, this should be much more on a wider spread community, finding partners, doing work together, invest here, because in the end we are all doing the same thing again and again and again. And what all the business units in Bosch are doing, 
other companies do as well. And it's nothing which is differentiating. We all would like to have a safer, more secure, proper world with a base ecosystem and make our money in the upper layer application and let the people do business and consolidate where there's the most benefit to concentrate on. Yeah. So as we are running shortly, uh, running out of time, we have, uh, I guess, uh, I think another three minutes. So we should give you like the opportunity to ask some questions if you have them. Do you have any questions? If yes, then please wait until the microphone is coming to you. And also the upfront information that we on Friday, they have still a BUF session uh, from Tim Bird on the corporate usage of Linux. So I think there's also a good forum to exchange and uh, to talk about things. Yeah, because actually for us, the core element is that we have the opportunity to discuss it with you, with other companies, to go more into this direction, collaboration, onto this, like, let's say, corporate level. Okay, so questions? Otherwise, we can fill the last two minutes easily. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing? Okay, so we are here uh, until Friday. We, um, we would love if you would come to the Birth of Feather session from, from Tim to discuss it, or otherwise just uh, approach us whenever you see us. Um, yeah, maybe it's not so easy with the mask on, but... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we would love to talk about all these things. So, yeah, thanks a lot for listening, and uh, yeah. we're looking forward to talk to you. Thanks so much. Thank you.